So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Sorry for the technical issues we were having, but welcome to our Access to Space for All series of webinars on conducting R&D in hypergravity and microgravity. Um, this is the fifth webinar of our nine webinar series, and today we will focus on physical science, especially on material science. So before we begin, we have some housekeeping rules. Um, first, um, please turn off your cameras and your microphones. I've actually noticed that Teams has made an update and um, we can mute um, your microphones and your cameras, so all is good, but please um, make sure to keep them off. Um, second, um, please use the chat box to ask any questions that you may have. Um, you do not have to wait until the Q&A time at the end. If you have any questions, um, comments, if you have any links that you want to share, um, anything, um, please um, put it in the chat box. And third, please answer our questionnaire that we will put in the chat box later on. My colleague Wenbin will be active in the chat, so um, he will be putting up our questionnaire link and also other useful links. So please make sure to um, check out on the web, uh, the links that he provides and also um, to answer our questionnaire before you leave. And lastly, if you are on social media, please use the hashtag access to space for all to help us promote this webinar. And we are active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at UNUSA. So, um, I don't know how many of you have been participating in our past webinars, but as I mentioned earlier, we are um, conducting a nine, series, a nine webinar series about hypergravity and microgravity. And our main objective of this webinar series is to really raise awareness of the amazing R&D done in hypergravity and microgravity and to trigger interest. Through these webinars, we want to provide theoretical knowledge and educational knowledge that can support hands-on opportunities such as our Access to Space for All initiative and the many other op um, opportunities available out there. The learning outcomes of these webinars are mainly first, the fundamentals, the special characteristics and advantages of hypergravity and microgravity environment. The second is overview of what type of research can be done in hypergravity and microgravity and its applications. So today, especially about what can be done for material science. Third, the overview of the available modified gravity platforms in the areas of applications and its benefits. So what you can use to actually test in hypergravity and microgravity. Fourth, how to develop an experiment to be conducted. So including the needed tests, the procedures, the technical things. And the last is the overview of the available experiment opportunities and the existing networks and experts. So um, we are in the fifth part. Um, we are um, diving into physical science from this week. We finished our three webinars about life science last week, and we will have two on physical science this week on material science, next week on fluid dynamics. And after that, we will go into technology demonstration. Um, the last two webinars will be um, giving you more um, information about the different opportunities. The available opportunities are the ones that UNUSA is providing. And regional activities will be focusing on space agencies and the regional activities that they're conducting as well. So I, I'd like to emphasize um, the link for the webinars is all the same. I know that um, many of you here have registered already. So you can use the same link to join in all of these nine webinars. And if you have registered, which I believe you have because you're here, um, you don't have to register anymore. I will be sending you um, reminders on Wednesdays um, right before the webinar. But you can, um, as I said, use the same links to join in. So um, all the updates will be posted to our Access to Space for All main website. And the webinar recordings and presentations will be posted to a different website, which is linked to our main website. It's called Past Webinars for the Access to Space for All. And um, we have all the um, recordings and presentations there. Um, I've actually posted um, the presentations of our professional speakers this morning. So um, if you want to check out um, their presentations, um, please go to the website. I actually posted just like five or ten minutes ago. If you already had the page open, um, it would be best if you can reload the page. And then I think the changes will be, um, uh, you, you will see the changes. And also the recordings can be found on our YouTube channel. I've organized a list for these Access to Space World Hypergravity and Microgravity webinars. So please go check out our YouTube channel. 
Also, um, regarding our Access to Space for All initiative, we have two opportunities open now. One is Kiboku, which is under the satellite development track. It is open until the end of May. Um, you will have an opportunity to deploy your 1U CubeSat from the International Space Station Kibo module. Um, if uh, um, it's a 1U CubeSat, of course, you can um, put cameras on. Um, you can build your own satellite, but thing is, it's another step to the hypergravity microgravity track. So it is an opportunity for you to test something in space in the 1U capacity. So um, if you're interested, please make sure to check out our Keybook Cube page. And the second opportunity open is drop test, which is open until the end of June. Um, this is an opportunity to um, to test um, microgravity experiments at the Bremen Drop Tower in Germany. Um, this is um, in cooperation with ZARM and DLR. These two opportunities are open now, but as you can see, we have different, um, many different opportunities under the initiative. Some of them have closed already for this year, but some of them will be open again later on in the year. So please make sure to check out our website for any new updates. So um, this morning, we will have a professional talk about material science research and development from um, Professor Masahito Watanabe from Gakshuin University in Japan and also Professor Yoshinori Furukawa from Hokkaido University also in Japan. After that, we will have a student talk giving us an example of what kind of research and development is done. And we have um, Malika Schmidt, who is a PhD candidate at the University of College London. And then after all of these speakers, we will have a dedicated Q&A answering all your questions. So if you have any, please make sure to put it in the chat. Also for 4.30 um, Central Eastern Time, um, Central Eastern Summertime, um, Vienna, um, we will have another webinar um, with the same contents, but with different speakers. So actually um, the presentations are all different and they will talk about um, different things. So if you're interested, please make sure to check this one out as well. Um, the professional talk will be from Professor David Brown of the University of College Dublin. And for the student talk, we will have two students. Um, one is Jonathan Nauer from Tufts University and the other is Quentin Quentin Champadizu. I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't know if I pronounced that right. I'm from University of Alberta. Okay, so now I'd like to give the floor to Professor Watanabe from Gakshuin University. And before I do, please let me um, explain a bit about Professor Watanabe. So he is from the Department of Physics at Gakshuin University. He joined the Fundamental Research Laboratories of NEC Corporation in 1989 and served in numerous roles there. And he is the inventor of the new crystal growth technique for large diameter of SI single crystals. Um, Dr. Watanabe joined the faculty at Gakshuin University in 2001 and his research includes the development of new materials processing methods using the levitation technique and microgravity in space. Also, um, after him, um, Professor uh, Yoshinori Furukawa will be um, uh, presenting as well. Um, Professor Furukawa is um, an emeritus at the Institute of Low Temperature Science, LTS, at Hokkaido University um, in Sapporo, Japan. He obtained his PhD in 1981 in geophysics at Hokkaido University, where he earlier graduated. Um, he has pursued his professional career in research at ILTS from 1978 to 2016 and has been the director of ILTS in the period of 2011 to 2014. And he is the author of more than 200 scientific papers. So I will now give the floor to Professor Watanabe. I'm going to share um, his presentation. So please give me a moment while I change my screen. And as you can tell, I'm not exactly the best at changing and sharing screens. So please give me a moment. Um, as I said, if you have any questions to any of the speakers, please make sure to put it in the chat. Um, and I see that Wenbin has already shared a lot of the information of our initiative. Please make sure to check that web page out as well. Okay, I am sharing my screen. I'm going to change it to full screen mode. I hope it is working. And if it is, I will give the floor to Professor Watanabe. Yeah, thank you very much for introduction. Me, Miss Mori. So, hello everyone. So today's uh, I and Professor Furukawa introduce uh, physical science in microgravity. 
for the focus on the material science field. So next, please. Yes, so all material science covers the many fields in science. So much researcher has interest in the solid state physics, but solid state physics is not so sensitive for the gravity. Gravity relation uh, related and gravity uh, sensitive phenomena is in the field of the crystal growth and the material processing field in material science. Uh, so today uh, I talked for this synthetic crystal making field. And next, Professor Furukawa's talk is very science, basic science for the uh, snow crystal growth. How his talk is how or the, why the crystal is make this beautiful shape. So next please. So I uh, I just brief for the introduction for the why the crystal growth and material processing is sensitive for the uh, gravity. So uh crist here here is the schematic figure of the growing uh, crystals here is the growing crystal and here is a uh, uh, liquid or the vapor phase and here is the interface position so uh ground on ground condition in the, uh 1g condition is a uh, uh, liquid and the vapor phase it has the density difference so that phase has the Flow that means the convection. This convection modulates this interface, so we cannot precisely observe the interface phenomena. But microgravity condition is no convection, so uh, we can easily to observe the interface phenomena clearly. So this is our motivation for using the microgravity condition for study of the crystal growth. And next, please. So my talk is related to the mat material processing using for the emissive liquid process. Emissive liquid process is not uh, mixing liquid to liquid using. So this case is on ground case in 1D condition has a, a heavy liquid in stay in the bottom part and right liquid stay for the top part and right, uh, right uh, liquid part is using the comb has a convection like this. So uh, this uh, separation is the, uh, fundamentally in decided by the interface energy, but in on ground condition, interface uh, phenomena is covered by the gravity effect, but microgravity condition, and if we use the uh, levitation of the emissible liquid, this is very typically uh, appear for the interface uh, property. So uh, this uh, inside liquid and outside liquid separate by interfacial energy. By that means the interfacial tension to make this core shape droplet. So this is my uh, motivation of using the microgravity condition for study of the emissive liquid processing. So next, please. So today. Uh, my main talk is this uh, interfacial energy project research in uh, International Space Station using the electrostatic levitation. So this is a member of our project team. Next, please. So this is the picture for the uh, material processing you know, on ground. Here is a crystal growth of silicon crystal and here is a uh, welding of the steel material and here is the solidification process for the uh, high uh, nickel based super alloy solidification uh, casting process simulation. This uh, process control needs for some physical properties and this liquid has the high temperature uh, field. So uh, our research is in immiscible liquid process and interfacial, interfacial phenomena is a main uh, interesting, but we need for the some physical properties of high temperature liquid. So please, next. So some physical properties mean that 
these physical properties. So density, here is the density. Density is basic properties of the material. And the liquid case is also very important uh, properties of the uh, material properties. And typical liquid uh, property is the surface tension and the viscosity. And uh, thermal control is need for the thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity. And also specific heat is the importance for the thermal control. And electrical resistivity and emissivity is related to some of these thermal uh, properties. So these uh, physical properties we call some physical properties. So next please. These is some physical properties measurement. We cannot expect these some physical properties from the theory. Just for the measurement is necessary. But on ground condition, we are very difficult to measurement of the high temperature liquid some physical property because we need to the ground condition uh, like this container material keep for the high temperature liquid and substrate like keep for this uh, this picture so this case is the container material dissolved into the high liquid temperature high temperature liquid has a high reactivity so we limit for the measurement of temperature. But in levitate the liquid sample like this, this case is no container. Uh, so we obtain the pure liquid sample properties, but in this case also the no temperature limit, very uh, high advantage for the measurement of the thermophysical properties. But on ground condition, a little bit difficult to levitate sample. So we need the microgravity condition for long duration. Next, please. So levitation technique has uh, many uh, idea, but this is this three levitation technique is the uh, major technique for levitating the sample and some physical property measurement. Here is the electromagnetic levitation. This is used for the electromagnetic induction effect. And in this electromagnetic levitation furnace, uh, we call the MSL EML facility installed in the Columbus in ISS by operation uh, ISA. And here is the electrostatic levitation. So electrostatic levitation used for the Coulomb force. So applying the electrical field and charge sample in here. So Coulomb force acts for the levitate the sample. So this uh, electrostatic levitation uh, facility, we call the electrostatic levitation furnace, ELF, is installed in Kibo in ISS. And this is the aerodynamic levitation. This is very uh, easy way to levitate the sample. So just uh, gas flow from the bottom of the, of the sample and gas flow levitate the sample. But this is only used in the ground, not a uh, microgravity con condition is suitable. So we use this EML facility in Columbus and ELF facility in Kibo used for the thermal property measurement and the interfacial uh, phenomena observation. But today's my talk is focused on electrostatic levitation experiment. Next, please. So this is a schematic figure of the electrostatic furnace. Uh, here is the levitated pool. Sorry, just back here. Here is the levitated sample. And here is the main electrode. So we applying the voltage in here and sample was charged. So Coulomb force acts for the keep for the position of this uh, levitated sample. These are the sub electrodes. These sub electrodes to control of the sensitive control of the position keeping of the sample and applying for the laser from the sixth direction and homogeneously heating the sample and the temperature measurement was uh, non-contact method and observation of the uh, levitated sample, sample shape change was the high-speed camera and obtaining the some physical properties. 
and next please. So this is a uh, movie for the levitated molten oxide sample in ISS by ELF. So you can see that not uh, move the sample position, but this is a liquid droplet. This is very good stable con control by electrostatic force in microgravity condition. So please stop and next slide, please. So this case is not good control case. So this is the same uh, oxide material, but control was not a good condition case. So you can see the moving for the sample. This is not the uh, melted, just a solid sample. But before the movie is the no moving. Oh, sorry. Yes, so we, good control of the levitation case, we are applying for the external force by main electrode. So we obtain the surface oscillation. So here is the surface oscillation frequency signal. This is our uh, observation data. So from uh, surface oscillation frequency data, we obtain the Fourier transform here, so we have the uh, surface oscillation frequency. This case is the frequency value is 168 Hz. And we obtain the uh, surface tension using the sample diameter and sample density. So this molten oxide surface tension is 419 mu newton per meter. This is surface tension smaller than uh, rather than the liquid metal case. Liquid iron surface tension is the 1,500 millinewton per meter. The liquid iron, liquid metal surface tension is the larger than that molten oxide surface tension. And next, please. So, and also we obtaining the surface free uh, oscillation data. So. Uh, here is the applying for the external force from the uh, main electrode, but stopped our external force applying. Here is the decaying damping of the surface oscillation. So from decaying time, we obtain the viscosity of the uh, liquid sample. So in this case, the decaying time tau was 168 seconds. So from this decaying time, using the relation we obtain the viscosity value is the two, uh, 24.7 millipascal second. This is uh, larger than the viscosity value of the liquid metal and the liquid uh, iron viscosity. Liquid iron viscosity about uh, uh, two millipascal second. So molten oxide viscosity larger than that uh, liquid metal, liquid iron viscosity. So. Uh, this is uh, not so familiar for the viscosity. The people to uh, imagine for the liquid iron viscosity is a little bit larger, but liquid iron viscosity very small, and liquid iron is very smooth liquid. So next slide, please. So using these uh, properties measurement, we trying for the. Uh, interfacial phenomena observation. So uh, I talked before uh, using this coaxial droplet using. So inside the liquid iron steel melt and outside liquid is molten oxide. So this is making only on the microgravity condition. If we make this uh, combining this uh, liquid iron and molten oxide. Liquid iron density is so larger than that molten oxide. So on ground condition, liquid steel is both keep the bottom and not make the quasher droplet. So next please. So this uh, immiscible liquid process, uh, molten oxide liquid iron case is uh, important for the refining and smelting process, but Another process is also important. This is the continuous casting for making the thin uh, steel 
products making processes. This case is also important for the molten oxide is here and the liquid iron is here. So interface in here, so this control is very important for the liquid uh, interface phenomena. And also the welding process is important for the interface phenomena. Uh, here is the liquid iron and here is the cover for the liquid iron for avoid the oxidation by molten oxide. So interface is here, so interface uh, tension control of the uh, welding shape and welding uh, property. So immiscible liquid of molten oxide and uh, liquid iron is very important for con process control. Next, please. So using the coarser droplet, molten oxide and liquid iron, we expect the two oscillation peak of the surface uh, oscillation frequency. So single droplet cases, I see, I see that just one frequency is peaked, but quasi droplet cases the modulate the core droplet at the surface oscillation by uh, difference oscillation frequency. So surface uh, oscillation has the two peaks in here and here. This is the difference of the temperature. And this is the numerical simulation expectation. So we trying to this phenomena by the real experiment trying to now. So today's morning, uh, Japanese time morning, we trying to the experiment, but this is uh, uh, not so good condition today. So we get not we cannot get this uh, good result. So next show, please try, please change. So next shows I uh, interfacial phenomena by parabolic light experiment before ISS experiment. So we predict some uh, experimental conditions. So uh, parabolic light experiment, we can use the microgravity condition during this two, 20 second duration. So using this uh, short time microgravity condition, we get uh, interfacial uh, phenomena. Next. Uh, yes. So, please start uh, moving. So, here is the making the coarser droplet case. So, you can see here black part is a liquid iron, white part is molten oxide. So, you can see the white part is covered, the black part. That means the molten oxide covers the liquid iron and make coarser droplet like this. So this image is not making the quasher droplet. Here is a liquid iron, and here is a molten oxide. This case is not make the quasher droplet, meaning that molten oxide not cover the liquid iron. So this shape is stable. Okay. So next, please. So we call this shape is the Janus shape. So quasher droplet case, we obtain the surface oscillation frequency. So this is a very agreement for the expected. So two oscillation peaks we have. So from the, these two peaks, we get the surface uh, interfacial tension value is 700 to 1,000 millimeter per meter. This is a difference of the oxide composition, and but uh, not to over 1,000 millimeter per meter. Case. So this case is making quasher droplet. So next, please. So, quasher drop, not making quasher droplet case, Janus droplet case is also we can obtain the interfacial tension value. That is advantage in microgravity experiment because the microgravity condition, the liquid droplet make the completely spherical shape. So we can easy to fitting like this uh, fitting by the spherical shape for the obtaining the image in the here and here. So we obtain the easy to the contact angle in here to here. So from the contact angle, we obtain the interfacial tension value. So this case is, is interfacial tension value is 1,220 new, millinewton per meter. This is a little bit larger than Quasher droplet case. So next, please. So this is 
the interfacial tension value is related to the、uh, which shape is stable, core shell or the Young's droplet is、uh, interfacial tension value is decided because the、uh, uh, total surface free energy is the minimum case is stable droplet shape. So, total free energy is the Surface tension of the liquid iron, surface area of liquid iron, and surface tension of molten oxide, and surface area of the molten oxide, and interfacial tension value, and interfacial tension area. So these values decide the minimum、uh, total surface free energy. The minimum of the total surface free energy case is the stable shape. So if The surface area is not change case. The interfacial tension value decides which is the stable shape, core shell or the young shape. And next, please. So, this、uh, idea we、uh, expect for the which is what is the stable shape, core shell or young shape.、Uh, this case is the making the young droplet case. The surface, total surface free energy minimum point is here. So, this is uh, uh, this value, this axis showing the surface area of liquid iron and molten oxide diameter、uh, ratio. So, this about 0.5 case is like this surface area is liquid iron and molten oxide. And this is minimum case is making the Janus drop. And Please, the next. So, c o a s h e l droplet case is minimum is here. One is the totally covered the molten oxide. So, this case is the minimum surface free energy. So, the c o a s h e l droplet is the stable shape. So, this is a, a parabolic flight, our experimental result. And this experimental result we using for the condition of the experiment for the ISS. Experimental condition and sample selection. So, we r e trying now、uh, more detailed experiment for the temperature dependence of the surface tension value and how the、uh, oxide composition is changing for the c o a s h e l drop or the Janus drop in trying for the ISS experiment. So, please, next. So, summary of my talk. Uh, I introduced the levitation technique and microgravity condition for the high temperature liquid in study in material science for understanding interfacial phenomena in material processing. Microgravity condition combined with the levitation technique has a big advantage. So, we using the electrostatic levitation furnace ELF, we hope clarify the interfacial phenomena between the liquid iron and molten oxide near future. So, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So, next is、uh, our international collaboration member. This is, I、uh, thank you very much for this、uh, collaboration person. And here is uh, uh, our colleague for the JAXA for the ELF operation and public r i g h t experiment collaborating work for our university student and the collaborating university student. So, thank you very much. This is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Watanabe.、Um, Professor Furukawa, if you can share your screen now. Okay, well, can you see? Was right? right?、Um, it's not in full screen. Really? So just a moment. So, Professor Watanabe's、um, introduction was really interesting bringing in the levitation techniques and about the material processing. It was a lot of technical aspects, but I think it was a good example of how experiments are conducted.、Um, he was explaining about、um, having parabolic flights first and then preparing for the ISS so that you can see the different phases of how experiments are being developed.
Um, for um, Dr. Furukawa, he will be giving us more about um, protein crystals, I believe. So I know he's trying again, so we'll wait. Um, if you have any questions um, to the speakers, please make sure to put them in the chat. We have these amazing professionals here with us. And um, any easy questions, technical questions, anything is welcome. Do you think you're able to do it, Furukawa? Okay. Or so can you see? It's still not in full okay, screen. Not already. <laughs> um, just a Trump. moment. Yep. And in the background, I will open my file as well so I can help. How about this? No. Is it just me? <laughs> Um, I don't see it in full screen at the moment. Do you have two screens? Are you sharing from uh, the application? Professor Furuko, I do yes. have PowerPoint, so. Oh, OK, yeah, perfect. Okay. Great, All right. yes, thank you. Okay, so um, my name is Yoshi Furukawa. I'm talking from uh, Sapporo, Japan. So today, so I'd like to talk about the, uh, our uh, experiment carried out in, uh, in uh, international international space station. Uh, this is these are a little bit uh, old experiment. We carried out uh, this experiment in already uh, uh, six or. Uh, 10 years ago. So my talk is about the ice crystal growth experiment uh, con uh, conducted in ISS and Kibo uh, module. So, so this is my first uh, slide. Uh, professor, uh, Atanabe uh, started this, his talk uh, using this uh, same slide. So this uh, slide, this slide shows a uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, beautiful crystals. So first, uh, this is a uh, uh, snow crystal. This is that is the uh, ice uh, growing from uh, uh, water vapor, and also these are mineral and metal crystals, and this is a protein crystals. So and uh, we can find uh, many kinds of uh, crystal like this uh, in our in our world. So, but uh, and our, my motivation for, for my research is the why and how uh, these beautiful patterns, crystal patterns, formed in nature. And also, the, this is a crystal growth uh, 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 material, uh, crystal growth uh, subject, which is the, uh, the key concept for the material science researches. So we start. Uh, so and uh, I, I think uh, you, uh, you are not so familiar about the snow and ice crystals. So I'd, so I'd like to talk about the ice crystal a little bit in my introduction. <clears throat> the ice is the also, uh, of course, the uh, uh, crystal of water, uh, which is one of the most uh, abundant and you uh, Critters uh, materials on Earth, and its phase transition uh, governs uh, various important phenomena on Earth. So, and uh, uh, ice relates to the uh, various phenomena. For, the, for example, this is the, uh, the uh, phenomena and environment science and glaciology uh, relate to the ice crystal growth. Uh, for example, and solid and liquid precipitation and the aerosol formation and the ice sheet in Antarctica and also glacier and uh, also for depression are uh, related uh, to the ice crystals. And also ice is the very in the field of uh, biology in South Zero environment conditions. So the, because the uh, many animals are living in a sub-zero temperature condition, but they never freeze. 
uh, when uh, when they live in sub-zero uh, conditions. So and uh, so it, uh, it's uh, it's related to the the why uh, they they can survive in such kinds in that uh, uh, conditions. So it is another important and uh, interesting subject. And also, ice uh, water is the, the common materials in the cosmic uh, area and the planetary side, uh, area. So, and ice is also very important in this field. Anyhow, so, and in order to understand the these interesting phenomena, uh, the crystal growth of its uh, water uh, is very important uh, subject to understand. And uh, ah, and this is uh, uh, and also I like to show these uh, pictures. Uh, ice crystals, recently ice crystals have been found on the Moon and the Mars, Europe, and the other uh, uh, satellites. And uh, so this ice uh, can become the source of a water supply for the uh, interplanetary exploration in the future. And uh, these ice is uh, ice uh, strongly related to the presence of life on the planet. So in this sense, uh, this these ice is very important. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, subject to study. So, and uh, in this sense, so ice is the, uh, also very important uh, research subject. No? So, uh, so, so, and uh, so why, and so, uh, do, why study the ice crystal growth? So ice crystals is one of the key materials to study the fundamental of crystal growth. And it relates to the nucleation pattern formation and uh, morphological stabilities, and also growth kinetics and uh, impurity effect. And uh, also uh, water is a uh, ubiquitous materials on the Earth and uh, as well as in our planetary system. So, and uh, the phase change of uh, First change kin kinetics among the uh, three phases of water is very important to drive uh, various uh, natural phenomena. So these are our motivations why we studied ice, ice crystals. So and uh, based on this uh, motivation, uh, we carried out ice crystal growth uh, in the uh, in, uh, in space uh, using a uh, Japanese experiment module uh, Kibo uh, connected to the International Space Station. Mm, so this is, uh, so you can see it, uh, the picture, this is a uh, Kibo module. And as uh, the crystal growth is a generally time consuming phenomenon. So it takes, uh, uh, we need a, a long time to observe the ice crystal growth. Uh, uh, so, you, so, and uh, if we want to do the microgravity experiment, we need a, a long term microgravity conditions, uh, which, which, which is achieved only in such a spacecraft. So, and uh, we also tried to use a uh, uh, drop shaft and uh, 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 airplane uh, uh, for the microgravity experiment, but uh, the uh, microgravity time is not so long, for, uh, so it's not so to of ice crystal growth. So and uh, we uh, uh, so before uh, I start uh, uh, what the details of our uh, research. I'd like to say a uh, little bit the uh, history of uh, ice crystal growth experiments carried out in space uh, in Japan. So, and uh, uh, there were uh, four experiments. The first one was carried out uh, in 1983, which was the getaway special uh, project uh, using a space shuttle. 
So in this experiment, uh, the growth of snowflakes uh, was uh, carried out uh, in the uh, in space. And uh, it means uh, snowflake uh, 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 grow from a water vapor, which is a vapor growth uh, crystal. So, uh, and, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, they couldn't obtain the good data from this uh, project. And, uh, and uh, other three uh, projects were carried by myself. And the uh, second one is a sounding rocket experiment carried out in 1998. And uh, we did uh, the gross experiment of ice crystal uh, from uh, super cool water. So this is a uh, melt gross uh, experiment uh, of ice. So, and uh, it's uh, different from uh, growth of snowflakes. So you should be note about this. And uh, this is a very short, uh, um, on, uh, we, we, we could, only one experiment, we could do the only one experiment uh, using this, by this experiment. So we, could, we couldn't obtain the good data by the technical, uh, 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 by the technical uh, trouble. And so after that, uh, we tried, uh, ice crystal grows in space station uh, two times. The first one was carried in 2008, and the second one was carried uh, in 2013. So, and uh, these are, so we, uh, the first one, uh, we tried to observe the pattern formation of ice crystal, and uh, for the second one, we tried to observe the input effect for ice crystal growth. So and uh, this show uh, this uh, uh, slide shows uh, uh, the general concept for uh, crystal growth. The, uh, uh, when we uh, consider the crystal growth mechanism, it is quite important to measure the growth rate and uh, to observe the uh, pattern formation process. So, and uh, we tried, uh, the ice, uh, we, we carried out the ice crystals in the space and uh, twice. So first, for the first experiment, we tried to observe the pattern formation of ice like this. So, and in this case, we could obtain the very beautiful dendrite, dendrite patterns growing from, uh, uh, growing in uh, super cool water. And using uh, first, uh, the result of our first uh, uh, space experiment, we discussed about the, the uh, pattern formation mechanisms of ice. And uh, for the second experiment carried out in space, uh, we discussed about the uh, impurity effect uh, for the ice crystal growth. This is also a very important subject. So, and uh, Fortunately, we could uh, the space experiments for ice crystal twice. So, and um, we uh, uh, we change uh, the uh, the main subject for the first one and the second one. And uh, from the, from, uh, from both uh, experiments, we could obtain the very nice data. So, and from this, I'd like to speak uh, uh, our experiment in space a little bit, uh, the details. So first one, first slide is a very, uh, basic concept for ice crystal growth in a super good. And uh, experiment, experiment is very simple. Uh, we prepare, we should put it, this is a concept. So we, pre we should prepare the uh, super cold water uh, in, a contain uh, in the glass uh, containers. And uh, the water is cooled down uh, below zero uh, degrees Celsius. And then uh, this is a glass capillary. And the glass capillary is inserted into the, uh, the super cold water. And uh, so 
uh, when the, we obtain the supercooled states for the water, uh, we cool down, uh, quickly cool down the uh, glass capillary at here. Then, so ice crystal are uh, nucleated here. Okay, so this crystal uh, continues to grow in the gra uh, glass capillary, and finally, the ice crystals appear at the tip of the capillary. Okay, so, and uh, uh, while uh, the ice crystal is growing, uh, grow, uh, in the capillary, uh, the uh, only one crystal can survive uh, when the crystal reach at the end of the capillary. So, and uh, so this is actual picture uh, which was taken in, on the ground. So this is a capillary, and you can see the beautiful pattern here. So, and uh, this is an easy experiment on the ground, but uh, it's not easy to do uh, in space. So, we, um, but uh, uh, in order to uh, realize uh, this uh, experiment, we develop a, a growth cell like this. So we prepare the very small growth cell, and then so and also we need, uh, prepare the nucleation cell, and uh, the sam water sample is filled in the growth cell, and uh, we, uh, when the uh, uh, supercooling state are reached, uh, are achieved, the uh, nucleation cell uh, starts to uh, nucleate the ice crystal. Then this is uh, ice crystal starts to grow in the capillary, and finally you can obtain the beautiful pattern. So, and, uh, and this is a system uh, for the uh, space experiment. The, the complete, we have a, we, uh, the concept uh, common for the ground experiments and uh, space experiment. Okay, so and uh, basically, uh, so, uh, we use uh, this concept for the for our uh, two experiments. And uh, in order to do uh, the uh, experiment in space, we uh, developed uh, a very special uh, ice crystal uh, cells. Ice crystal cell one was used for the first, ex experiment, first experiment in 2008, and uh, ice crystal cell two was used for the 2013. And uh, these apparatus were launched to ISS keyboard module and uh, placed on the stage of uh, the uh, solution crystallization, crystallization observation facility in keyboard module. Ice crystal growth ex uh, experiments were controlled uh, by the telecommunication system from the ground. The growth process and nice crystal could be observed on the gro uh, ground with a few second delay. Right, so, and uh, uh, these uh, ice crystal growths uh, were repeated uh, more than 100, 100 times uh, for both projects. So, and uh, for the, these experiments, we could obtain the very nice uh, ice crystal, uh, ice, very nice ice crystals, and we could uh, we could uh, uh, obtain the very nice, very good data uh, for crystal growth. So, and uh, I'd like to show the movies uh, for, uh, obtained in space uh, for, the, for the next slide. Okay. Yes. So, and uh, this. Uh, is uh, 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 this movie shows uh, ice crystal growth in uh, super good wood. In 2008, and you can so uh, these uh, patterns uh, interfering fringes, uh, and you can see the very nice, uh, uh, very uh, symmetric. Uh, ice crystals growing in uh, uh, supercooled water. So, and uh, as you know, so there is no uh, convection flow in space. We could obtain the very uh, symmetric and uh, very nice patterns in space. 
However, uh, this is uh, uh, grand reference experiments carried out uh, be uh, before the uh, launching uh, using the same experimental setup. So, and uh, but uh, in this case, uh, the convection flow occurs in a growth cell. So, uh, so you can find that uh, crystal is not so symmetric, and uh, this uh, uh, so there are uh, long uh, uh, dendrites uh, arms and also short arms. So, and uh, you. We can uh, you can see the uh, completely dif complete difference uh, between the uh, the space experiments and the ground experiments. Uh, so this is a nice uh, ex a nice uh, demonstration for the uh, microgravity experiments in space. So and uh, we could obtain the many data uh, like this. So using the data, this uh, uh, data. We, um, we, uh, we tried to analyze uh, the uh, growth rates and the pattern formation mechanisms. And finally, so we uh, could, uh, we discussed a new model for the morphological pattern formation, uh, morphological instability and the pattern formation of ice crystals uh, growing in space. So, and uh, if, uh, so, this is a nice uh, symmetry. So, and uh, so this symmetry uh, helps uh, the, uh, the development, develop, development of new models very well. So this is the first experiment. And for the second experiment, we tried to, the, uh, to, to detect the impurity effect for ice crystal growth. And uh, so, as an uh, impurity, we used uh, antifreeze glycoprotein, which is a very special protein included in uh, uh, in uh, fishes uh, living in underneath uh, uh, sea ice. Okay, so and uh, so and there is a sea ice. So underneath the sea ice, uh, the uh, sea water temperature is about uh, minus two degrees Celsius. In this uh, cold temperature, we can find uh, many kinds of uh, fishes like this. So and uh, the body temperature is about uh, minus two degrees Celsius, which is the same as uh, uh, the uh, water temperature, but ne they never freeze. Uh, in uh, at that uh, low temperature condition. The reason why uh, that uh, mm, the uh, blood includes a very special proteins uh, called as uh, antifreeze glycoprotein. So we use uh, uh, this protein as a, as a uh, impurities for the ice crystal growth. So if we uh, add uh, this impurity, uh, we can observe the uh, very different growth patterns of ice. So this is a uh, uh, patterns uh, obtained uh, pure in pure water without any uh, impurity. So and uh, we can obtain a very nice uh, dendrite pattern like this. However, if we uh, add uh, this kind of uh, impurity, we obtain the uh, hexagonal plates or the faceted uh, dendrite pattern like this. This is completely different, uh, differ from uh, uh, the uh, patterns, uh, crystal patterns obtained in pure water. So, and uh, we used uh, this kind of uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, and this one uh, general concept of antifreeze gravity protein. I I I'd recommend some of that. This and uh, this this term, uh, protein is a functional protein to control the ice crystal growth. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, this protein is included in uh, blood of fish uh, living in the super freeze seawater. 
And uh, this uh, uh, protein uh, prohibits uh, freezing the bodies under the supercooled state. And also, this is a key material for life evolution in the IC satellites of the planetary system. So, and uh, as we just we consider that uh, it's uh, very important to understand uh, uh, the mechanism of uh, the uh, input effect uh, for this for ice crystal growth. And uh, in order to do, uh, in order to observe the ice crystal growth in uh, uh, water, including uh, this impurity, we develop uh, new apparatus and uh, we carry the experiments uh, as a second uh, project. So, and uh, I just show the, only the pic, uh, movies uh, obtained, uh, of ice, uh, obtained in space. So and uh, here uh, you can see the uh, the uh, po uh, polygonal patterns. This is a ice. This is ice crystal, and uh, we are looking at uh, the basal phase of ice crystal. And these lines uh, show the interfering fringes uh, uh, obtained from a reflection of a growing interface. You can see that uh, the uh, this interfering fringes is uh, 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 moving uh, in this direction. So it means the this interface is growing uh, in the uh, normal direction of interface. So and uh, analyzing this uh, interfering fringes, we can obtain we could obtain the uh, the growth rates very precisely. And then, so you, uh, uh, and also we obtain the uh, many data like this, and using this uh, data we uh, did, we uh, we could obtain a very nice, very good uh, result. So this is a, a summary for, uh, for the uh, second experiment, and uh, so uh, using this data we found uh, two. Uh, important things for uh, as a input effect. Uh, so first one was the uh, growth enhancement by impurity. So and impurity uh, are usually considered as a factor to inhibit the crystal growth. So usually if there is an impurity, uh, the crystal growth rate is reduced very much. However, uh, in the experiment, we found that uh, growth was enhancement enhanced uh, by the uh, by this impurity. Uh, this is a very new uh, finding uh, for the in, uh, for the uh, the uh, impurity effect during the crystal for the crystal growth phenomenon. And also, uh, we found. Uh, Growth oscillation occurs during the uh, ice crystal growth. The growth rate uh, oscillate, oscillated uh, uh, periodically. So, and uh, so growth oscillation is a very important uh, phenomenon uh, when we uh, uh, discuss uh, about uh, this kind of uh, 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 patterns uh, of, uh, observed in. Uh, for example, I uh, agate crystal. So this is a mineral crystal. So and uh, in the cross section of this crystal, we can see the uh, this kind of uh, um, patterns. These patterns are related to the uh, con impurity concentration uh, period exchange of uh, and that uh, uh, this pattern may occur. That many people consider that uh, uh, this pattern may occur by the oscillation of growth rate, real rate growth. However, uh, there was not uh, there uh, any direct observations of uh, 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 the periodic change of a growth rate 
uh, before our experiments. However, uh, in our experiments, we uh, clearly observed the oscillation of the growth rate. And uh, so you, you should, uh, we should remember that this is a microgravity experiment. So it means uh, there is not any uh, convections. So, and uh, so this, this is not the uh, effect of a uh, convection flow. So, and uh, we, it means we could observe the, uh, the gross oscillation uh, which relate, uh, relating to the, uh, the kinetics of growth. So this is very important result. So, and this is a summary. So, and uh, two series of ice, ice growth experiments were successfully carried out in Kibo. And uh, first uh, experiment, we, uh, this, we could discuss the pattern formation mechanism of ice dendrite. And for the second experiment, we found a uh, new uh, phenomenon related to the in, uh, impurity effect. So one is first one is a growth enhancement by impurity, and the second one was the uh, growth oscillation by uh, impurity. So and uh, these uh, uh, so these are our uh, results uh, obtained by uh, space experiments. So and based on these ex and results, I could we just uh, we we could understand the many things. For example, related to the biomineralization. Uh, so biomineralization is a crystal growth in organic materials controlled by the biological macromolecules uh, occurring within and um, uh, within an organism. So and uh, it means that. Uh, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, research phenomena. So, so, and I could obtain the, uh, the hint to understand the mechanism of this uh, important phenomena. Okay, like this. Uh, and if you want to now explain more, so please uh, download uh, uh, this paper. Uh, so appeared in the uh, International Journal of Microgravity Science and Applications. So this uh, published in uh, Japanese Society of Microgravity uh, Science. And uh, this is an acknowledgement that we appreciate to the many peoples, especially these peoples help us. And also we uh, thanks uh, to the, uh, the many, many peoples related to our uh, uh, space, uh, space experiments. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Hurukawa, for that really interesting presentation about ice crystal growth. It's really interesting to uh, understand that the fundamentals of um, ice crystal growth really um, connect to, to understanding about the planetary system and many other things. So thank you so much. Um, the first question, was from Madhavan. How many years would it take for quantum computing implementation in space vehicles? Um, I believe this was a question that you were you put when um, Dr. Watanabe was presenting. So um, maybe Dr. Watanabe, do you have any um, answers to this? How many years would it take for quantum computing implementation in space vehicles? I I'm not sure if this is exactly relevant. Um, in that sense. So, uh, it is difficult to answer the question. So, the quantum computing is uh, many methods to now trying for the application. So, the if uh, using the silicon crystal case, so that is uh, using now normal CPU material. So if you want to use the silicon crystal case, is a much more time to need to develop for the quantum computing materials. Uh, 
some groups to succeed to using the silicon crystal to uh, quantum computing uh, devices. But uh, to commercialize is uh, much years is necessary for more. That is my answer. Is it okay? Thank you, um, Professor Watanabe. Um, Madhavan, if you have anything yeah. to elaborate, um, let us know in the chat. And I know the question, the next question is from you as well. Um, I think this was for Professor Furukawa. I think you mentioned it when he was speaking. It would be interesting to know the longevity yeah. of electronic equipment in space compared to ground. So, um, Professor Furukawa, if you can answer, um, the longevity of electronic equipment in space compared to ground? Uh, so you mean the electric? Yeah, I think he's saying um, electronic circuits, for example. So, um, <laughs> it's a difficult to answer the question. Um, So question is about the apparatus. Um, Madhavan, if you can elaborate your question in the chat again, that would be great. You want to know about, um, for example, electronic circuits, how, what is the difference um, between space and ground of the longevity of the electronic equipment? So how long they, Oh, not him. Um, if you can elaborate on that a bit more, that would be great. Thank you. Um, the next question is also to Professor Furukawa, so I'm just going to skip over uh, first. Um, so the question is, I am interested to know more about ice crystals related to environmental science and glaciology, um, respect to aerosols, ozone holes, and ETC. So. Um, is there any um, ice crystal um, experiments conducted for environmental science, glaciology, to uh, research aerosols and ozone holes? Uh, yes, uh, there are many, many uh, researches about that. And uh, for example, uh, the, I talked about the aerosol, um, uh, about the um, uh, ozone hole depression, for example. So, and uh, ozone hole depression, uh, ozone uh, depression occurs on the ice surface. Uh, that is a chemical reaction occurred in ice surfaces. So, and uh, uh, in order to obtain the um, ozone depression, so we need uh, ice crystal in the ozone uh, and layer. Uh, so, and uh, in that layer, uh, the uh, ice crystals must uh, form, must be formed. Uh, so, and uh, also mm, in that case, ice crystal growth uh, is very important subject to understand the mechanism for ozone depression, uh, make, uh, ozone hole formation. So, and also, uh, for example, glacier on the glacier. Uh, for example, in Antarctica, uh, there are a lot of uh, ice. So in uh, those, uh, the formation of uh, sea, uh, ice sheet in Antarctica related is related to the is related to the uh, the <clears throat> uh, snowfall. Uh, how to say mm, the falling snow so from the sky. So, and uh, in that case, uh, it's, and the temperature is very low in Antarctica. So in order to uh, understand the formation of ice sheet, uh, we have to uh, understand the formation mechanism of snow uh, in the air. So that is a very important subject. So in, the, in the, that sense, uh, it's, there are many, many uh, research subjects about the ice related to the uh, environment. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that answer was clear. The next question is also to Professor Hurukawa. 
Um, in the beginning, um, you mentioned the importance of the ISS for running um, experiments of crystal growth because it takes time. Um, however, in the video in slide nine or eight, um, in the experiment where you used super cooled water, mm -hmm. um, it was very fast. So um, like in the order of seconds. So can this experiment, for example, be replicated in a drop tower um, using a parabolic flight huh. Or um, it, it will, will there be any kind of constraints? Mm. And has it been done before? Uh, yes. Uh, so I forget uh, to say about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the time uh, for the experiment. So and the movie, movie is, uh, how to say, uh, the um, short term. <laughs> so actual time is uh, much more longer. So, and uh, in order to obtain the one crystal, we, it takes uh, at, uh, at least uh, uh, 15 minutes, uh, mm, 20 minutes. So it's uh, too long uh, to do the uh, experiment uh, using a drop shaft and uh, aircraft. So we need a uh, uh, long-term microgravity experiment, uh, 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 microgravity time, uh, Realize in space. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. The next question um, is also to Professor Furukawa. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of questions. <laughs> what are the key differences in mechanical properties of the ice in space and on the ground? Sorry, I couldn't hear. So yeah, I'll repeat. Noise. Yeah, with the noise. Um, what are the key differences? in mechanical properties of ice in space and on the ground? Um, so, mm, so mechanical properties of ice is, should be the same. That is, that is a material pro properties. So it does not uh, influenced by uh, the gravity. So, and uh, if we, uh, so, and also there are many, many uh, researches about the mechanical properties of ice. So those are the results are used to understand the, for example, uh, the uh, stability of a planet. And uh, so some planets uh, have a lot of ice. So it's very important to understand the stability of those ice on the planets. So, and uh, in that sense, uh, ground experiment for the uh, so, uh, mechanical properties of ice is also very important subject, I think. Mm. Thank you. I think that was clear as well. Yeah. The next question is from Juan Carlos. Um, Professor yeah. Furukawa, you talked about how difficult it was to experiment with ice crystals in space. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of difficulty would be expected if these experiments were carried out in other celestial bodies, such as Mars or an orbiting planet with higher gravity? Mm, yeah, <laughs> well, it is also a difficult question to answer. Mm. Yeah, so, mm, and, so I think I don't know. There is no <laughs> even no uh, experimental uh, result about that. So and <laughs> um, but uh, mm, uh, usually the, mm, the gravity in on the satellite is uh, not so high. So and uh, probably. Um, Not so big difference between the uh, the high planet planets gravity and the Earth's gravity. So hmm. sorry, I cannot answer about that. It's very interesting subject, but I have no answer about that now. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Furukawa. Yeah. That's a new area that yes, a bit probably new area. So nobody. I, I don't know the, any experimental uh, results about that now. Yeah. Thank you. If there's anyone in the crowd who knows something, please mm. put it 
the chat, but um, I believe it's a new area. And Juan, um, if you um, study on it, please let us know in the future. <laughs> Okay, um, I'd like to first um, introduce um, Dr. David Brown. So um, Dr. David Brown is um, following a BE in mechanical engineering from UCD. Um, David worked for the Garrett Corporation, um, which is now Honeywell, in Los Angeles, California, and Waterford Island, on Ireland, on casting turbo challenge turbocharger impellers, sorry. From 1987 to 1990, he was involved with joint research in the UK on twin roll casting of aluminum alloys. He was awarded a material science um, master's for this work. In 1990, he joined the faculty of the University College Dublin, where he now leads the phase transformation research group. Um, there are so many things I can explain about David, but I think he will give a better introduction of himself. So I'd like to give the floor now to um, Professor David Brown. Thank you. Uh Azuki, um, so I'll just uh, share my screen um, to get the talk started. I hope you can all see that. Yeah, it looks perfect. Okay, good. So thanks, uh, Azuki, for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, as I say, my, I am uh, David Brown from University College Dublin, where I uh, am from the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering and uh, direct the Phase Transformation Research Group. So I just like to start um, asking the question, why would one want to carry out research in microgravity and hypergravity? Of course, pointing out that um, microgravity is close to zero G. On Earth, we have one G and hypergravity is greater than this. So gravi gravity has a very strong effect on any material containing a fluid and many manufacturing processes such as casting involve manipulating a liquid, often a liquid metal. And this flow is affected by gravity. And as a result, the parts uh, produced and um, their quality and performance are um, affected by gravity. The best way to assess the effects of gravity is basically to remove it and see what happens. We can also increase gravity levels to see what happens as well and that's hypergravity. So just some some basics. Um, some basic maths. Again, it's not a, this is a general presentation, so I won't get into too much detail, but of course, F force equals mass times acceleration, according to Newton. Um, for gravitational force, the acceleration is that due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared on Earth. But of course, on different um, planets uh, and our moon, there are different values of gravity. Uh, for example, on Mars, it's 3.77 meters per second squared. Um, so we might end up having um, rovers, even vehicles on, for example, Mars, and, and you would need to know the, um, the gravity levels there to design the uh, vehicle correctly. So mass is, is uh, density multiplied by, by volume. So just substituting that in, we get the gravity force is rho, by V by G. So if you think of a container of material of height H sitting on a lab bench or bolted to a spacecraft, M can be a solid, a liquid, a gas, or a mixture of such phases. Now, if it's a solid, the density doesn't normally vary with position in the material. Um, but if it's a liquid under dynamic conditions or a gas, the density may indeed vary. Um, so we it can vary in any of three directions, but let's consider the variation with dimension X, some horizontal axis there on the sh as shown. So M is a, is is some um, fluid, um, and the density can vary if either the temperature 
um, or the composition vary with x. So if t is a function of x or composition is a function of x, then density will also change with x as shown. So as a result, we have different densities in different parts of the material or the in, in, in different parts of the container. So the higher density fluid will drop and the lower density fluid will rise, resulting in a natural convection loop, in this case in a clockwise sense within the container. So such variations in temperature occur, for example, when you're cooling a liquid metal in a casting process. And variations in composition can occur when you're cooling or solidifying a liquid alloy in a mold in a casting or welding process. Um, because the solid formed normally has a different composition than the average, resulting in compositional variations in the liquid. And hence, hence the natural convection is due to thermal and compositional or solutal effects and is called thermal solutal convection. So various manufacturing processes then are affected by gravity, um, not manufacturing processes like machining, which are in the solid, but particularly those processes which involve liquids and often, well, usually solidification, like casting, welding, 3D printing in metals, um, injection molding of polymers, etc. So this is not relevant to all manufacturing processes. Microgravity then is an environment where the gravity level is almost zero, um, and it's achieved when the experiment itself is in free fall. So the whole experiment is falling towards Earth. So therefore, relative to the experimental lab or the container, there are no net gravitational forces on the sample being studied. And there are a number of ways of achieving microgravity, including drop towers, parabolic flights, sounding rockets, orbiting spacecraft, and space stations. And we're going to look um, at, at, at all of these. Again, some pictures, uh, drop tower, parabolic flights, sounding rockets, space stations. Now they all have their own characteristics. Um, so we're considering here four, four um, microgravity um, environments, drop towers, parabolic flights, sounding rockets, and the International Space Station. The duration of microgravity achievable on a drop tower is up to 10 seconds. On a parabolic flight, it's 22 seconds, but this is achieved multiple times during the flight campaign, as we'll see. Sounding rockets, somewhere between six and 13 minutes, depending on the rocket. And in the International Space Station, you have continuous microgravity. Um, I would point out that on parabolic flights here, we can also tailor the G levels so that you can get those mimicking those on the moon, lunar or Martian gravity levels, which may be interesting to some of you. Again, in, um, in diagrammatic form, um, we can see the duration of microgravity, uh, which goes from low, low values in drop towers to higher values in parabolic flights, higher again in sounding rockets, and then continuously in, on the ISS. These on the left-hand side show the G levels. They're all um, at maximum 1% of gravity on the Earth. You're going right down to real microgravity, which is, is technically exactly 10 to the minus 6 G, but that's essentially zero gravity. Depending on the platform, there are different lead times to getting a um, experiment from, if you like, a blank sheet to a flight, um, starting with drop towers, parabolic flights, sounding rockets, and the ISS it would take about five years to go from you know, getting your ideas together to having an experiment running 
and the ISS. So some relevant topics I'm going to discuss um, are relate to solidification of alloys, metal foaming, measurement of properties of liquid metals, transparent analogues to metals, and diffusion in liquid metals. So why would one be interested in alloy solidification? Well, it turns out most metallic components and systems have at some stage been through a solidification stage, be it for aerospace, structural, automotive, medical devices. Um, there are so many examples in our world today of systems and materials which have been solidified from the liquid. Which brings me to my own journey in not so much into space, but into space research. And um, Hazuki did ask us to explain how long we'd been involved in this and how we got into space research or microgravity research. Well, my started way back in 1984. I had an undergraduate project on casting of ductile irons at UCD Dublin with um, a visiting master's student from Tanzania who was developing a foundry there for casting of automotive product of, of automotive components for off-road vehicles. Then I became a, a foundry engineer in Honeywell for a couple of years. Um, and here I became all too familiar with casting defects and things that can go wrong in solidifying metals. I moved on then to Oxford to do research on twin roll casting for my master's degree. Then I set up the phase transformation research group back in University College Dublin, working on developing casting processes and experimental and computational research on alloy solidification and phase transformations in general. I returned then to Oxford to do a doctorate on microstructural evolution during solidification. And towards the end of that time, I was introduced to a European Space Agency research consortium on microgravity solidification uh, by Professor John Hunt, who was my uh, DPhil advisor. And at that time, Professor Bernard Billia was leading this uh, consortium. So I guess I've been involved in microgravity research now for about just over 20 years. So um, a little bit of uh, science um, never goes astray in these matters. So we just consider, first of all, a binary phase diagram, the aluminium copper system, and consider an alloy with 20% copper, the rest being aluminium. At any temperature, T then, uh, the solid has a composition shown by the left star and the liquid composition showed by the right star, shown by the right star. So basically, because the solid formed has less than the average percentage of copper, there is a lot of co copper rejected into the liquid. So solute is dumped out of the solid into the liquid as the solid liquid interface proceeds. So looking at that then, um, if we look at the top left corner of this phase diagram um, shown here, we're considering uh, solidification of an alloy from left to right, so the heat is flowing to the left. It's essentially a one dimensional problem here. Um, so we consider then this is the solid liquid interface solidification moving to the right. Um, the temperature gets higher as we move into the liquid because the heat is being transported to the left. So there's a variation in temperature into the liquid and the solute is being dumped into the liquid by the advancing solid liquid interface. So it's like a snow plow in which the, the snow is essentially in enhanced copper levels in the liquid. And then if we recall, if we have changes in composition or temperature with X 
with horizontal direction into a liquid, we get variations in density and then natural convection. So consider then metallic alloy microstructure. Um, typically, it consists of either columnar long grains or equiaxed um, shorter grains with, uh, with a small aspect ratio. And we often get a columnar to equiax transition, which is well known in um, those involved with manufacturing with metals. So looking then in a, a more um, schematic way, we have the possibility on the left here of fully columnar castings, fully equiax castings, or a col partially columnar region leading to a, an equiax region at the CET columnar to equiax transition shown here in the yellow line. And the, and the, on the right here is a simulation of that from Hong Biao Dong and Peter Lee. The columnar growth being blocked by the formation of equiax grains ahead of the advancing columnar front, leading to a columnar to equiax transition. And all of this would be affected by very much by gravity. Here are some um, cellular automata simulations of meltback and re-solidification of columnar grains on the right, equiax grains next to that, and then all grains here leading to a columnar to equiax transition. This is work of my uh, one of my PhD students, Daniel Drelin, um, and this is the early parts of a model which are being applied to additive manufacturing, so 3D simulation of grain for structure formation in 3D printing. Physical phenomena then which are encountered in microstructure formation from the liquid include nucleation or the initiation of solid, the growth of solid, the flow of heat and mass, sedimentation or flotation of dendrites, solute redistribution in the liquid, etc. So if we're modeling then, there are various complexities which have to be taken into account. And I've highlighted a couple of these here in red. They are fluid flow due to natural convection and motion of unconstrained solid dendrites, either in the flow or due to buoyancy forces. So it turns out that the physics and also the modeling can be simplified by removing gravity. So the physics and the modeling are simplified, um, but unfortunately the experiments become more complicated. This brings me to a project called XOR MON, which is X-ray monitoring of solidification under microgravity and terrestrial conditions. And the objectives are to generate new knowledge on solidification and diffusion in situ and in real time using radiography to develop a compact experimental environment that would fit onto microgravity platforms such as parabolic flights, sounding rockets, and the space station, and thereby to produce benchmark data on gravity-free metallurgical processes for use to validate computational models and also to provide to provide fundamental um, knowledge on uh, such processes from a scientific point of view. So the current Exormon partners um, are shown here. It's mostly European a consortium from France, Germany, Norway, Ireland, Sweden and the UK, and also with scientific cooperation from Professors Karma and Beckerman in the USA. Now the basic setup of the Exormon um, approach is shown here. So central to this is the furnace where the melting and solidification occurs. It's, it's, it consists of two parts heated independently of one another. So they can be either the same temperature or different temperatures. If they're the same temperature, 
you get a more or less isothermal um, field of view here. If one is hotter than the other, then we have a gradient uh, furnace. So we have thin samples of the alloy of interest. We melt it and start solidification. And during solidification, we pass X-rays through the material. And because of the contrast between the solid and the liquid, we can see the, uh, the, the solidification proceeding. Now the sample has to be quite thin in order to enable sufficient transmission of X-rays to achieve a good uh, spatial and temporal resolution. And also generally we only want one crystal in the thickness of the, um, the thickness direction of the sample. Otherwise we get um, superimposition of more than one crystal in, in the along the length of the beam, which makes it more difficult to separate later. So, so far um, we have developed the relevant technology. We have the compact hardware developed. That's the so X-ray source, the furnace and the detectors. Suitable for use on parabolic flights so far and also sounding rockets. We've developed three variants of the furnace, a gradient furnace an isothermal furnace and a diffusion furnace. We've developed supporting uh, image enhancement and analysis software, and we're currently working to design a module for the International Space Station. We've completed many experiments on Earth and also many in microgravity, some of which I'm going to present today. So uh, some work done primarily by ourselves and NTNU in, in Norway involved taking a, a sample of aluminium copper. And uh, th these are terrestrial experiments. Um, and in one case, we have a horizontal sample. In the other case, a vertical sample. And you can see if we run them side by side, the quite different um, results. You can see on the right the effect of gravity. Um, the aluminium rich solid dendrites float because of their lower density. Whereas in, in the horizontal sample, you know, the, the effects of gravity are reduced consider considerably. Um, OK, so most for most alloys, um, Equiax dendrites would actually not float but would sediment because generally solid is denser than liquid but it's just due to the chemistry of this particular alloy system that uh, because of the partitioning there's more copper in the liquid and less of this heavy copper in the solid. So we then wanted to, to do this on a, on a sounding rocket. Um, which again is um, this Maser is a particular brand, for want of a better word, of sounding rocket. It's the material science experimental rocket um, run from Swedish Space Corporation in northern Sweden from the S range launch pad. So the rocket is fired up. It goes to essentially a parabolic um, trajectory. When it comes out of the Earth's atmosphere, it detaches from the boosters, so at that stage the rocket is in decelerating and in free, uh, free fall. Um, and we get about six minutes of microgravity time on, on board. And the experimental module lands about 70 kilometers away um, by a parachute and has to be retrieved. So this is just an example of uh, the team, one, one experimental team from Maser 13 in November 2015 at SSC. You can see the rocket in the in the center there. And us at the, the um, launch tower, signing the ceramic nose cone, etc. So key experiments completed by the Exermon team are first of all in sounding rockets in microgravity. Maser 11 in 2008 was on foaming experiments. Maser 12 in 2012 
on columnar solidification, MASER 13 in 2015 on Equiax solidification, and MASER 14 in 2019 on the CET. And we've also completed various parabolic flight experiments um, supported by ESA and operated by Novospace in Bordeaux in France. So turning first to the foaming experiment, this is courtesy of um, Professor Francesco Garcia Moreno in the TU Berlin. Um, so this involved um, mixing um, aluminium silicon copper alloy with a foaming agent. Um, and when uh, heated to melting point, um, the foaming agent becomes activated and causes bubbles to emerge in the liquid metal. Um, on Earth, there is a certain amount of gravity pull, which affects the formation, cell rupture, stratification, etc. Whereas on the uh, flight in, in zero G, um, there's a much quicker and fuller and more equal foaming. And again, you, we we didn't, or I should say they didn't, um, get the same level of uh, stratification uh, or unequal foaming due to gravity. And then after solidification, uh, you can see the difference. So this is relevant to, um, you know, cellular foam materials for crash absorption and safety in um, all sorts of vehicles. Um, also, perhaps filter development of filters, um, and maybe also in biomedical devices. Then, Maser 12 uh, was run by Professor Henri Noyanty from University of Marseille in France on columnar solidification um, using the Extramon GF furnace. It was the first ever metal alloy solidification in, in microgravity with in situ observation. Um, so again, this, this, this is a sample here shown inside the container, the holder, which is put in, in turn slid into the two part furnace uh, with a window for the, uh, the field of view where the x-rays go through. And all of this is um, encapsulated into the rocket, uh, the, the, the relevant section of the rocket. By the way, this video will be available uh, later, so don't worry if, if you if you can't take notes. And if you are not watching live, but watching a replay, welcome as well. All right, so um, the Maser 12 campaign, uh, Maser was launched. Um, there was good microgravity, everything went well. Uh, all the temperature was downloaded and the, uh, the module was uh, retrieved. Now, with um, microgravity research, it's good scientific practice to do ground reference tests, where essentially you do the same experiment on Earth. Um, and then by comparing the two, you can extract the effect of gravity by induction. So in addition to the microgravity experiments, some video stills of which are shown here for columnar solidification, reference tests were done on Earth both with the sample horizontal and vertical, as uh, for example, I showed you a little bit earlier from some work uh, we did with, uh, with uh, NTNU. So shown here then side by side are the in situ observation of columnar solidification of aluminium, again, 20% al copper alloy, um, and on Earth and on, on the left in a vertical arrangement and on the flight on the right. So both in both cases you see columnar solidification from the bottom, but on the left you see the formation of some, the, the, the detachment of some parts of crystals from the columnar zone, which then float um, because uh, it, this is in a vertical arrangement in gravity, they float up. Turns out they float into hotter liquid, so they melt. Um, 
but it's quite different the two um, the the two uh, sequences. We also see some porosity forming on the right hand image. Again, pores forming is also of interest in industry because it can lead to um, to defects in 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 cast welded and additively manufactured parts. So the first experiment uh, using a device combining X radiography and a gradient furnace um, for solidification study in microgravity was performed and results were published on the growth rates versus the experimental conditions. In both cases there were fragmentation of columnar dendrites but in 1G they floated upwards due to buoyancy but in micro G they actually moved slightly to the cold side towards the uh, columnar front due to shrinkage which is a non gravity related effect it's just due to volume contraction on solidification maze 13 then is one in which i was centrally involved um, in that this was led by university college dublin and we were focusing on equiaxed solidification okay it was done in november december in s range um, north of the arctic circle so this is just a photo taken around around midday. Um, somewhat different furnace called Exermon Sol. It was specially designed for this experiment. Again, we have rotational symmetry, somewhat different to the gradient furnace. Uh, so it's like a, a, a circular sandwich. The sample disk in, in the middle is encapsulated by the crucible and ceramic um, housing and heating elements. And then the X-ray is shone through the, the hole um, through into the uh, detector and camera to give us the image that we need. Again, you can read uh, details in the, in, in the paper. And in general, in most of these slides, I give the paper um, so you can look for more details if, if you want them later. Um, and also the slides will be uploaded by the UN office on their website, the slides. So um, this is the rocket. Um, you see the two booster stages. The payload is shown here in, in a sort of golden color. There are a number of modules, a number of experiments, including Extramon Sol and MEDI, which is I'm also going to mention um, later on. So uh, blast off was in the dark, which wasn't that surprising given the time of year up there. Um, and these are the results. So on the left, we have a ground reference test with the sample horizontal, uh, which we performed before the flight. And on the right, we have the microgravity results. And um, on the bottom, we have the temperature varying during the solidification taken from the furnace thermocouple readings. Um, so there was no wild motion of the grains, even in the, in the ground reference test, because the sample was in horizontal um, orientation. As we've seen before, this is the orientation which is less affected by gravity. Then we looked at the various stills from the videos for both microgravity and terrestrial at similar temperatures and similar times. And we could um, interrogate the results to find out, to plot the length of the dendrite arms versus time for some selected crystals in both microgravity and terrestrial conditions. Um, so in addition to grain growth, equiax motion was quantified. So here is the result from the 1G situation. So these are the, the origins of the equiax grains. The red is the point is where they started. Uh, the blue is how they moved. <clears throat> mm. 
excuse me, and the red is where they ended up. So, um, so you can see their their trajectory. Now, they didn't travel very far. I mean, these are in microns. Um, but for the one, the microgravity situation, they hardly moved at all. Um, so looking at the 1G situation, uh, we looked in detail at the trajectory of this center of these grains, and we could see how they moved. So they were more mobile in microgra uh, in on Earth than in microgravity. Um, now we've recently, um, thanks to Jonathan Mullen, PhD student in the Phase Transformation Research Group, um, started to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to take these videos and automatically um, identify individual dendrites such that each becomes a separate video and they can use this data then to measure growth rates, the rotation, study their impingement, etc. And this is being applied to um, the Maser 13 video and in future will be applied to legacy X-ray videos and new work and also future X-ray videos of solidification to basically speed up uh, the post experimental analysis and to make it more accurate. And indeed, we're quite happy to work with with colleagues um, on in, in, in on this area to investigate their own videos or, or other such experimental results. So then to conclude, um, we could see grain motion, uh, rotation and, and motion throughout terrestrial solidification. We did manage complete melting and solidification in the microgravity period of the um, of the experiment. Um, there was really no grain movement early in solidification in microgravity based solidification. But later on, past dendrite coherency, which is the point at which the dendrites impinge upon one another, some grain motion was observed even in the microgravity um, experiment. And this was because of shrinkage and volumetric contraction, which is not a gravitational effect. Indeed, the differences between the 1G samples uh, and the and the, the the difference between terrestrial samples in a horizontal versus a vertical orientation was greater than the difference observed between 1G horizontal experiment and the microgravity experiment. But we have isolated for the first time in situ shrinkage induced motion of equiax grains because we know for definite that on the uh, on the on the Maser 13 microgravity flight, there were no effects of gravity. And we're now using machine learning to interrogate the videos for quantitative data. Which brings me to Maser 14, um, which is was the most recent um, sounding rocket experiment led by Henri Goyant and Guillaume Reinhardt from Marseille. Um, these results are currently being analyzed and the manuscript is currently in preparation. Um, so after that, um, you know, the data can be shared publicly, but their results are very interesting too. So to, to conclude on Maser rocket, uh, sounding rocket studies, um, we've completed four, uh, camp four campaigns. Um, and in the last three, there's been columnar solidification, equiax solidification, and columnar to equiax transition. So this is essentially like a trilogy of solidification experiments, which cover the, the whole um, range of typical microstructural features seen in casting, welding, and 3D printing in microgravity in situ. So we have some great, really great data as a result of all of this work. And we're happy to share share these results with you all. Moving on then to parabolic flight experiments. 
There have been a number of these. Um, I'm going to concentrate on one again from the group on Marseille, although Gerhard Zimmerman of Access and myself have also been involved in Exramon parabolic flight experiments. Um, so uh, this one is on directional solidification um, and the columnar to equiax transition. Now the parabolic flights, I'll just explain the sequence of events. Um, one is flying along at normal, as normal in a pass as you would in a passenger aircraft, although it's hard to get on these even nowadays. Um, and then the pilot pulls into a, a, a sudden climb. And during this period, you get about 2G. And then when with about a 45 degrees incline, uh, the pilot um, turns off the engines and the aircraft is in free fall. So we get this about 20 seconds of zero G. And then of course we don't want the free fall to continue too long or we don't come back from the experiment, bearing in mind we're on board. So the pilot pulls up and then in this, here we have 2G again and we're into normal conditions. And these are repeated. So there are 31 parabolas during a flight. Each flight lasts about two or three hours. So again, uh, Henri's team um, used the Exermon GF furnace, in this case uh, encapsulated into a rack, specially designed and built for the sounding rocket. Um, in this case, they used uh, again aluminium 20 weight percent copper, so it's great that we've been using the same alloy all of this time because it means that we can compare uh, with this we can compare the um the, the experimental conditions without worrying about changes to the material although in this case it's grain refined uh, to an, an to encourage equiax solidification so the best way to explain this is actually to show it um so what's going what i'm going to show here is the video of the solidification and on the right is the G levels at the same time. So they're both synchronized. Um, and you can see that this will follow what happened in the flight. Um, and it's an example of one parabola. So we start off at 1G, solidifying from the bottom. And then the pilot's going to pull up. Um, and we get uh, two Gs um, coming up soon there. And here we get to like an explosive production of equiax crystals. We have high G, then we have then the drop to zero G. So here we have a very dark area. This is high solute content of copper, but this is microgravity conditions. And then the um, the, the aircraft pulls up to, uh, to normal conditions again, two G and um, return to normal flight conditions and things stabilized. So, you know, we don't have time to um, explore this in detail, what's happening, but uh, needless to say, they're very nice, uh, very nice um, results. And um, the group from Marseille and uh, Aachen have put together these slides. As on the top, we see, see the position of the aircraft. Um, between the two dots is the microgravity situation. Um, and what is happening has, is explained in great detail. Um, but just to conclude, um, the there was a columnar to equiax transition provoked by all of those equiax grains appearing it, when gravity increases. Um, so the parabolic flight campaign showed not just uh, terrestrial results, not just microgravity results, but terrestrial leading to hyper, zero G, hyper G and one G. Um, so it showed what happens when you vary the G level. So this is quite a quite an interesting um, experiment. Again, you can read the details in the paper. One of the experiments was led by um, the UCD team, primarily Andrew Murphy and myself with help from Swedish Space Corporation. Um, I won't go into that, but because it's actually on a YouTube video, uh, which you can watch yourself and it explains what we've done in general, and the details can be seen in the paper. 
Now we don't always have um, the access to X-rays, um, and indeed the first exper ever experiments to look at dynamic solidification were in so-called transparent compounds that freeze like metals, which were first um, which were first reported on in the 1960s. Um, but this this has now been taken into microgravity as well by essentially the group of um, Access in Aachen in Germany, um, primarily led by Laszlo Sturz, and also with Gerhard Zimmermann. Um, and these were also on the same Maser 13 experiment. So I'm just going to show you the videos. Um, the um, the papers you can you can read the details in the paper, uh, but on the left the ground ground results, on the right the flight results. So you can see the equiax grains forming on the left, and because of the solid being denser, the sedimentation of the grains, which makes their analysis more difficult. But when the grains solidify on the right, the equiax crystals in this um, organic transparent alloy, they're stationary, so it's easier to study the dendritic growth, and you don't get the same sedimentation that you get in the Earth, the terrestrial experiment. Um, but of course, you do um, you do you do get more solidification on the cool side. So I'll just show those again. I'm just going to take a drink of, of water while they're showing. <clears throat> well, actually, they're not showing, but um, I did get a drink of water. Um, so uh, properties of liquid alloys, um, it's, it, it can be easier to um, measure the properties of liquid alloys in microgravity, especially if the liquid alloys can be held in a container's manner by an electromagnetic field. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to go through quickly through this um, because uh, the presenters following me, that's Janetan and Quentin, are going to discuss property measurements in space. But just briefly, we do we carry out property measurements to improve quality control, to support uh, manufacturing capabilities by making the predictive capability of models higher, and because we need the thermophysical properties of the liquid in order to um, in order to model uh, the processes uh, with high fidelity. Um, and on the right here, we ex I explain why, or sorry, the, I should say Professor Doug Matson from Tufts University explains why microgravity is good in these situations. But I think Janetan and Quentin will also explain that. So with respect to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, all of this work involves sharing multi-user facilities to address common manufacturing challenges throughout the globe, enabling low carbon um, and sustainable manufacturing to proceed by means of um, sort of knowledge intensive uh, manufacturing processes. Um, how this containerless processes in space is accomplished is either via electrostatic or electromagnetic levitation. Typical measurements include density, surface tension, viscosity, and specific heat. Um, on board the uh, electro electrostatic levitation furnace or the electromagnetic levitation furnace. And the sort of results then are um, given by uh, th this group from uh, primarily from University of Ulm, uh, where they have measured the surface tension and viscosity to very high degrees of accuracy for a number of important nickel based super alloys as a function of temperature, both superheated and supercooled liquids. All right, so um, 
what um, I'd like to do then is um, just finish off discussing diffusion in liquid metals. Um, and this is a very neat experiment from the German Aerospace Research Center. Um, and this device here is based, contains a number of samples. And the yellow and blue metals are different metals. And the whole sample is, is heated, the whole device is heated, it's called a shear cell, so that all of these metals are molten. Um, and then if one um, pushes, slides over the bottom with respect to the top by one intermaterial distance, then we have a diffusion couple. So the, the bottom of the yellow will be meeting the top of the blue, etc. And you can see this happening um, in this uh, short video. If you just watch for the change there. Now, in this case, the, um, the denser liquid is on top, so you get a lot of convection. And so there's no way you can measure diff chemical diffusion between those on Earth. So as a result, um, this has been done in microgravity. Again, if you watch um, this uh, shift, um, again, this is done in a sounding rocket, and there's no gravity-driven convection, which means that the mass diffusion is by, sorry, the mass transfer is by diffusion only, and some very nice results here comparing uh, microgravity to 1G, um, 1G results. So again, this shows the, uh, the, um, the great benefits of using microgravity to perform experiments which are of fundamental scientific and technical importance. Um, DLR have also developed a, an, an isothermal furnace for a studying of a study of solidification, in this case equiaxed. And what they've managed to do here is isolate the, the red dendrites from the blue um, from the blue liquid, but also the chemical composition of the liquid is shown by the deepness of the hue of blue. So you can see the solute being rejected by the growing um, dendrites. And there is a plan as well to, to carry out, to use this equipment in microgravity. So moving on then briefly to hypergravity, um, G much greater than one. Um, one can use a centrifuge such as ESA's large diameter centrifuge and do a solidification experiment along the arm of the centrifuge, for example, as done using this in this gamma titanium based alloy, which is essentially an intermetallic alloy, solidified in space uh, on a sounding rocket in 1G and then at varying levels of G in the in the centrifuge, and you can see the difference in the microstructure and the scale of the dendritic features as you change G. Plotted here, for example, is the dendrite arm spacing as a function of G. So sorry I didn't spend much time on hypergravity. It's mostly about um, microgravity. Um, but I guess uh, there's probably more work being done on microgravity, but we can have you know, a complete spectrum of G levels from zero up to a high value. So that's quite a lot. Um, so I, I, I now need to summarize. Um, I'll just say that gravity affects materials during their processing. This in turn affects the microstructure and therefore the properties and performance of materials and components, so it's important. The effects of gravity can be assessed if you turn it down or turn it off. And this can be done in a number of ways, but mostly in space. Of course, you can also turn it up, as in hypergravity. So via this initiative, um, the United, United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs um, is providing opportunities to, me, to all for um, access to space in development of their sustainable development goals. So I'd like to sum up by, by thanking you for listening 
um, to thank the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, in particular Hazuki, for inviting me to present. I'd like to thank ESA for funding the work. Um, to Enterprise Ireland uh, as the National Delegate for Ireland within ESA, for also supporting a lot of this uh, work. And to, to Science Foundation Ireland uh, for their recent support uh, for uh, study of additive manufacturing and solidification in 3D printing. There are many contributors to this work. Um, I hope I've acknowledged them on the slides. Um, certainly, there are co-authors in the papers. Um, you can email me if you have any questions beyond today, as shown below. And um, if you want to see more of the space research carried out at University College Dublin in Ireland, you can visit the website of our Centre for Space Research. And the URL is, is shown below. So thank you, um, and I welcome any comments or questions. Thank you so much, Professor David, on this amazing collection of um, information. I think that was a lot of information for people to um, digest, but still it is an amazing collection of the different things that are done in the different platforms. Um, there was a, a really great explanation about the fundamentals of material science, why it's really beneficial to conduct experiments in microgravity and hypergravity. And it was really great that um, you explained on the various um, experiments that are done in uh, the drop towers, the sounding rockets, ISS, um, explaining the different platforms. So thank you so much for this amazing overview. You're welcome. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to have the opportunity to uh, talk about these things. Thank you so much. And um, as David explained and as I um, explained earlier, um, don't worry everyone, the presentation is on the website already. Um, so if you want to check out, um, if you're interested in a specific experiment, you can look at the presentation and um, reach out to those um, people that are re really involved in it. So thank you so much. And now I'd like to move on to our student speakers. We have two um, speaking slots today. So first I'd like to um, introduce Jonathan Nauer. Um, she is a PhD student in mechanical engineering from Bangladesh. She has a passion for space research and she has been working with NASA as a student researcher for the past four years. Her work mainly focuses on material development through thermophysical property measurement, and she has had the opportunity to participate in several microgravity projects as her research. So I will give the floor to Janetin. Thank you, Hazuki, for the introduction. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. You should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, we see it. OK, uh, well, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Janatun Nawar, and I am going to present today my research on thermophysical property measurement using containerless levitation technique in space. So first, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, as Hazuki mentioned, I am from Bangladesh, and I did my bachelor's there in aeronautical engineering and came to Tufts uh, to pursue uh, graduate studies. I got my master's in mechanical engineering in 2018, and now I am a third year PhD student uh, in mechanical engineering. Uh, my research work focuses on thermophysical property measurement of pure metals and industrial alloys. So before coming to Tufts, I actually had no idea that we could do material science research in space. I was always fascinated uh, by space. So when I came upon an opportunity to work on materials supporting NASA's space exploration, I grabbed the opportunity and I have been working on this uh, research since 2017. I utilized NASA Marshall Space Flight Center electrostatic levitation facility as a part of my uh, master's thesis and developed a mathematical model to predict mass evaporation of nickel-based super alloys. In 2019, we flew two of our sample in the parabolic flight. And uh, in 2020, we had uh, our months long space testing in the JAXA ELF facility in collaboration with JAXA. Uh, 
So the motivation of my work comes from supporting alloy development for commercial and industrial and obviously space exploration applications. We need high fidelity thermophysical properties in order to accurately model and uh, uh, predict the behavior of high temperature molten metal manufacturing applications such as casting, welding and additive manufacturing. So the bigger goal of my research is to support industries by pro providing these thermophysical properties so that we can improve the manufacturing uh, process of the uh, parts required for these applications uh, by leading for better performance, higher reliability, and uh, more importantly, towards a sustainable future. So why do we go to space uh, for this levitation technique when we can achieve them in ground-based facilities? Uh, Minecraft environment offers a wide range of advantages in uh, containerless levitation techniques. The first one is that it reduces contamination at high temperature by limiting the nucleation sites during solidification. Since there is no uh, gravitational force acting in microgravity, the free surface ensures uh, property, precise property evaluation. We also have better control of convection in space and limited buoyancy and sedimentation. The International Space Station also provides us an extended uh, experiment time compared to the parabolic flight testing where we only have a limited window of testing. So the two levitation technique that I mostly work with are electrostatic levitation and electromagnetic levitation. In electrostatic levitation, we use uh, electrostatic force uh, to levitate a sample between a pair of electrodes. And in electromagnetic levitation, we use electromagnetic force to levitate the sample. Uh, so in my talk today, I'd like to talk about uh, the facilities that we utilize. And the first facility that I want to talk is the JAXA ELF. Uh, so JAXA ELF is currently uh, located in the ISS Kibo module. And you can see Cap uh, astronaut uh, Scott Kelly in front working with the JAXA ELF here. And uh, the picture on the bottom right shows the uh, sample levitated uh, inside the cha ELF chamber uh, between a pair of vertical electrodes and the horizontal electrodes are used to uh, stabilize the sample during the testing. So the next uh, facility that we utilize is the NASA Marshall Space Flight ESL facility, which is uh, which is in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, you can see the chamber from the front here and uh, the chamber is opened up during maintenance on the left. So both of this facility offers uh, processing of metals, semiconductors, and uh, oxides. Uh, the JAXA ELF was initially built uh, to process oxides in space, uh, and uh, we just uh, conducted testing, our first test in metals in JAXA ELF uh, during our ELF testing. The next facility is the DLR ESA campus. So there's a Tempus electromagnetic levitator on board the, airboard, uh, the Airbus 300, as Professor Brown mentioned in his talk. Uh, and we, in this parabolic flight, we achieve 20 second worth of microgravity. So what we do is that when the flight is going up the parabola, we start heating the sample, and then on the uh, micro, when the microgravity is achieved, we run the tests, and then uh, as the uh, flight is coming down the parabola, we finish. Uh, testing the sample. And the next facility is the ESA, ESA ISS EML. This is also currently on board the International Space Station, and this is located in the Columbus module. And uh, you can see that the two coils here, which uh, in between which the sample, are the sample is levitated using electromagnetic force. So my work um, mostly covers with electrostatic levitation, but I am going to present today my analysis on the JAXA ELF testing and the ESA Tempest uh, flight testing. So we have successfully processed uh, both pure metals and industrial super alloys in space. Uh, we have processed three uh, pure gold metals in the JAXA ELF uh, facility, the gold, platinum, and zirconium, which are uh, extensively been used for various purposes and uh, the 
two industrial super alloys we have are Inconel and CMSX. Inconel, uh, both Inconel 718 and 65 are greatly used in aviation and marine because of their high corrosion resistant properties. And CMSX 10 and CMSX 4 plus are single crystal super alloys, which are used for mainly turbine uh, manufacturing, turbine blade manufacturing. So the thermophysical properties that I am interested in are density, thermal expansion, surface tension, and viscosity. So to give an idea that uh, how we conduct the test uh, is that we levitate a sample in electrostatic levitator or electromagnetic levitator, and then we heat the sample to simulate the casting or any uh, to melt the metal in general. Uh, and the figure on the top right uh, shows a typical time temperature profile where you can see that we start heating the sample and then once the sample is heat melted completely we superheat it to some extent and then we uh, hold the sample in a long thermal hold where we excite the sample uh, to measure surface tension and viscosity and once the heating is done uh, we let the sample free cool and during that free cooling we measure density so the data that we get from these tests are uh, we uh, the main data we get from these tests are temperature, which is used using pyrometry and the high speed video camera recording. So from the high speed video camera, we can analyze each frame, which gives us the volume of the measured sample uh, from the projected backlit image. And uh, we can also track dynamic mass throughout the process uh, to account for any evaporation of mass loss and then we calculate density from this information. Uh, for surface tension and viscosity, we uh, apply a technique called droplet oscillation, where the sample is excited uh, by induced uh, oscillation through electric field in ESL and in pulse excitation in EML. Uh, you can see a sample oscillating in here, that's the ESL sample. So from, uh, from the sample uh, oscillation information, we can analyze that and we can uh, get the sample resonant frequency by applying FFT on the signal and we can use that for surface tension measurement. And by looking at the decaying uh, time constant of the signal, we can calculate viscosity. So in this slide, uh, the viscosity and surface tension is shown as a function of temperature for gold. Uh, this is the first time we have run gold in International Space Station, and uh, the JAXA ELF uh, values are shown in blue marker and the parabolic flight values are shown in the red marker. So the plot on the left shows the surface tension, the measured surface tension compared to the uh, published literature values. And we can see that the parabolic flight uh, values have larger temperature error bar. Uh, that's because the uh, data from the parabolic flight is quite noisy and we kind of solved this uh, problem once we went into space and uh, we performed the JAXA ELF testing, which is shown in blue. And uh, both of the uh, values from measured from the both of the facilities agree with each other and they also show good agreement with I1 agrees measured values uh, from IML2. So the plot on the right shows viscosity of liquid gold as a function of temperature and immediately we can see that there's less data point for parabolic flight in this uh, because uh, gold is so dense and it takes longer time to damp out. So we do not achieve sufficient time during parabolic flight uh, to get viscosity. Uh, but we got much more data point from the JAXA ELF uh, once we ran the test in International Space Station where we had enough time so the sample died out and we got uh, viscosity from it. Uh, the values measured from uh, JAXA ELF and parabolic flight are also in the same order of magnitude uh, for viscosity and it also are in the same order of magnitude as EGRI's uh, data point. However, uh, the measured values are uh, one uh, order of magnitude higher than Ofte's viscometer, uh, Ofte's method measured using viscometer. So to summarize my talk, the levitation research uh, takes advantage of the unique microgravity environment for accurate property measurement. And the space results that we have conducted shows good agreement with the ground-based testing. And uh, by utilizing this space research, uh, 
it can become uh, levitation can become a powerful tool for future space exploration and all of our research supports SDGs uh, goal for indus sustainable industry uh, innovation and infrastructure and responsible uh, consumption and production. So for my future goal, uh, I plan to finish my PhD and work in STEM, uh, preferably in space related application and start my own research project. Uh, for my bigger goal, I would like to inspire uh, people who wants to pursue space related research through my journey. And I would also like to help uh, young researchers through my story and uh, any other resources that I can possibly help with. My advice for those who are interested in space is that space is accessible to everyone. You can contribute and you do not have to be a biologist or a scientist or an engineer to contribute. Uh, you have to always look for opportunities to learn and uh, continuously apply. Uh, and last but not on the list, uh, the most important one is that uh, you have to be prepared to face unknown challenges because there's always challenges related to microgravity research. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for this inspiring presentation. Um, it's really interesting to see the actual experiments you're doing for thermophysical property measurement with all the levitation experiments. So thank you so much for this amazing sample, um, amazing um, experiment. Okay, um, I do see only two questions at the moment. Um, I know there's a lot of information that people need to digest, but if there's anything, please make sure to put it in the chat box. We have these amazing professionals and experts in the field, so make sure um, to ask them questions when you have the ch chance. Okay, my third speaker is um, Quentin, um, he is a third year PhD student um, from the Advanced Materials and Processing Laboratory, um, which is in the Department of Chemical and Materials yeah. Engineering, the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Alberta in Canada. So I will give the floor to Quentin now. Thank you for the brief introduction. So I'm going to share my slides now. Can you see them? Yes, it looks great. Okay. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on which time zone you are you are on. I feel lucky to have the opportunity to present my research at this event organized by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. And I'm going to talk about the analysis or the determination of growth velocity and thermophysical properties of materials using electromagnetic levitation. My name is Quentin Chandoiseau. And I'd like to thank the contribution of Dr. Varotan and Dr. Hennen to this um, uh, presentation. We are all part from the Advanced Materials and Processing Laboratory of the University of Alberta, located in Edmonton, Canada. So first of all, a little word about myself. I come from France and I graduated from the Ecole des Mines de Nancy with an engineering degree, which is equivalent to a master and uh, I majored in energy, environment, and process engineering. I had the opportunity in my last year to do a dual degree with the University of Alberta, and after two years in the program, I switched to a PhD in materials engineering. I'm currently on my third year as a PhD candidate, and I'm working on the measurement of material thermophysical properties using what is called the discharge crucible method. So it's a ground-based method, but um, used as an alternative to what is done on the ISS or on parabolic flights using electromagnetic levitation. So I had the opportunity to also work with data that are produced on the ISS or in parabolic flights. So a little word about our research, first of all, in, uh, in the lab under microgravity. So we use electromagnetic levitation to study solidification, but also thermophysical properties of materials. So we send samples on parabolic flights or on the ISS, and we use the electromagnetic levitation apparatus to do our experiments. We focus on dendritic growth velocity and the microstructure of materials, uh, but we also focus on the determination of density, surface tension, and viscosity by the oscillating drop method, as was presented by Janatun just before. On the right side, you can see, sorry, little problem. On the right side, you can see Dylan, one of my colleagues, is uh, also a PhD student, and he was in one of these parabolic flights. 
So when the moment, uh, when the gravity is cancelled, as you can see, this is when we run our experiments to look at how the samples are solidifying or determine also the, the thermophysical properties. Talking a bit more about electromagnetic levitation, so it was briefly introduced by Dr. Brown and also Jonathan. Uh, so I'm just going to be quick on this slide. We use electromagnetic levitation to make an electrically conductive sample levitate. What we want to overcome is the gravity force using electromagnetic forces. The main advantage of this method is that it's containerless, which means that your sample is just levitating, it's not in contact with anything, so there's no contamination, or at least limited contamination. We can also directly observe what's going on when the, the solidification is occurring or the shape of our drop levitating. And also the main advantage of conducting experiments on microgravity compared to ground-based experiments is that because the gravity force is much lower, we don't have to apply uh, great magnetic uh, forces, which means that there won't be any convection inside the sample, which will make the drop more spherical and easier to analyze. Typically, the temperature of the sample will evolve as it's described on this um, graph. At the beginning, you have your sample at the solid state. We will heat it up until we reach the liquid state. And then when we cool down the sample, we will reach what is called an undercooling temperature. The delta T. The undercooling just refers to the difference of temperature at which solidification uh, begins compared to when it's supposed to begin the freezing point. The higher the undercooling, the, the, more, the faster will be the solidification. After that, when solidification begins, we can see dendritic growth on the sample. And after some time, the sample is solid uh, one more time. During the cooling phase, this is when we can study the thermophysical properties of the sample using uh, the oscillation drop technique. I'm not going to present the theory behind it, but I'm going to show you some videos of how it looks like um, on site. So on this video, you have on the left side one camera, on the right side another camera. They are both looking at the sample from different angles. And at the bottom, you have this black line showing the evolution of the temperature of the sample with time. At the beginning, nothing is apparent, and then we can clearly see the sample heating up. It's becoming spherical as it's melting. And then when the temperature is uh, rising again, we can see the oxide layer on the right side melting also. Not melting, but disappearing. This process is also uh, triggering a lot of instabilities in the, um, in the drop, as you can see. And then when the oxide layer is completely removed, this is when we want to wait for the sample to be stable and then do our thermophysical property uh, analysis. I'm going to show you that uh, on the next slide. So here we are at the stage when we are go going to trigger oscillations in the sample. So you can see around the sample, we have this red contour that is detected by our algorithm to detect the edge of the sample. And these red lines are also detecting the radii of um, the sample along the horizontal and vertical axis. Now you will see that the sample is going to be triggered to oscillate like that. And we can see how it answers to this oscillation. As Jonathan just described, looking at the frequency of these oscillations, but also how they decrease with time, we can deduce the property of the, of the material, especially the surface tension and the viscosity. After some time, as the temperature is decreasing and the sample is becoming stable again, the oxide layer will reform, as you can see here. If we want to study solidification, we need uh, better camera, what, is, what are called high-speed camera, with more images per second. So on these two videos, I'm going to show you uh, what was a steel sample that we studied during the Parabolic Flag campaign of 2013. We used a 30,000 frame per second camera and a 42,000 frame per second camera, and we are going to study solidification under two different um, delta T, so under cooling. On the left side, you can see that the velocity of solidification was measured at 0 0.19. I'm going to show you how it looks on the video. You can clearly see solidification become, uh, beginning from the left and going to the right side. I'm going to just play it again. You have what is called a dendritic growth and some nucleation point, spontaneous nucleation point along the way. 
if we look at the second experiment, the delta T is much higher and the velocity is also much higher. And this will influence the way the solidification is happening, as you can see on this video. This is much faster and we can't see any dendrites or anything. It's just what you call the spherical front of solidification. Oh, sorry. By studying this kind of videos with these experiments, measuring the velocity at different undercooling, we can produce graphs such as this one for one material. On this graph, we did experiment under microgravity, but also just ground earth uh, based experiments. And you can see that the trend is similar, which means that convection inside the sample has no effect on the graph velocity of the um, solidification. What is also interesting is to see that after a certain critical undercooling temperature, the shape of the solidification front is changing from dendritic to spherical. So studying this kind of growth velocity is really important for the material field because this velocity of the solidification front will change the microstructure of your material. And ultimately, the microstructure of the material will influence the property of the material, such as uh, hardness, or toughness or strength. So by knowing how the solidification is happening, under which condition, we can try to optimize the property of our material for the use we're going to have for it. So I would like to acknowledge, of course, for this presentation, the support of the Euro European Spatial Agency, but also DRR or our industrial partners. If you have any questions or if you would like more information on the subject, you can contact us on this email address and also my supervisor, supervisor email address. I would conclude this presentation, as Jonathan was saying, that there are many opportunities to work uh, with uh, microgravity and samples. And if you are interested to look at materials properties or like solidification patterns, of course, you can contact us on this email address. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you so much, Quentin, for this inspiring presentation. It's really um, nice to see another different um, example of the actual thermophysical property um, measurement um, e levitation experiments that are being conducted. Thank you so much for this. OK, I'd like to move on to the Q&A. Um, if I'm right, I only see three questions at the moment. So um, if you guys have any please make sure to write it down now while we're doing it because we have these amazing experts here. So um, I'd like to start with the first one, um, which is from Michael. Um, he's asking about the charts that cover the various experiment options from the drop tower to the ISS. He seemed that it was very helpful and um, it's referring to David's presentation. So you identify the duration of the experiment as well as the lead time for those experiments. But what about the cost? So can you comment on what a researcher might expect um, for the cost variance from one type of experiment to another? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess the costs are sort of um, separated into two. Um, one is the cost of, you know, the, the, the research, um, you know, do, doing the ground-based research testing, building the, the facility. Um, and then there's then, then there's the, the cost of the flight, you know, the cost of getting to space. Um, typically, um, in Europe anyway, uh, what happens is that the research group like, like me and I guess like the group in Alberta um, and in Tufts, uh, we, we, we apply for the funding to do our part. And then the space agency often has a separate contract with industry. For example, in sounding rockets, it's with the uh, Swedish Space Corporation. Um, and that's kind of a, a private a private contract, an industrial contract, um, which the researchers don't see. We just turn up um, having done all our homework and tested everything. Uh, and you know, get get it incorporated into the in that case the sounding rocket. Um, so, if if you're looking at the total cost of microgravity research, I guess it's quite high. 
but the researchers don't see all of that. They just see the university based or the research institution based costs, which are just typical for, you know, PhD scholarships, uh, materials, equipment, travel, etc. Thank you so much, David. And if I may add, um, our access to space for all initiative opportunities are basically free of charge. So you do not have to pay for the actual experiments. You will need to um, prepare your experiment, um, th the actual experiment. And then if you bring it to Bremen, um, the drop using the drop tower, that part of the fee is um, you don't need to worry about it. Also, um, the housing costs, the travel costs, they will be covered by um, ZARM DLR and um, UNUSA. So there are opportunities um, for researchers, um, for students um, that can really um, have access to these amazing facilities in a, a very low cost, I would say. And it's not only UNUSA opportunities. I'm aware that ASGSR, ELGRA, um, these associations um, were introduced in our first introduction webinar, but these um, microgravity, hypergravity, like low gravity associations, they have a lot of projects going on. I know ESA has um, their educational part um, working on these, and there's a lot of industry and um, space agency partners that offer these um, opportunities at a lower cost. So if you're a student, um, if you're a researcher, I really recommend that you do your research on um, the, um, the opportunities that are available. Of course, we will um, talk about those in the later um, webinars that we will have, but um, there are a lot of opportunities. But of course, um, there are small costs involved, and I know there is a range um, using it on on Earth and going to that ISS is a totally different cost, but j just emphasize that there are a lot of opportunities out there. Okay, um, the next question is also from Michael. Um, his video was frozen for a bit, which also happened to me. So, can Professor Brown explain some of the potential applications of the microgravity mixed grain culminar or controlled culminar materials? So, are these applicable to antennas, for example? To antennas, um, well, I, I guess um, you know the the, the 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 these are for as solidified uh, materials, so like castings, welding, etc. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm not sure if antennas are normally made by some kind of um, metal forming, perhaps plastic deformation process, which might have more of an effect on the properties than any preceding um, than it, than any preceding um, solidification stage would have state state would have. Um, I think really what we're doing is um, kind of looking at fundamental uh, the fundamentals of solidification, reporting on that and then trying to in increase by increasing our knowledge of solidification and the effects of gravity by improving, th that helps improve models, computational models of solidification, and therefore earth-based manufacturing processes. Okay, thank you so much. The next question is from Manavan. He's asking, um, how long uh, does it take for the materials to lose their magnetic property? I'm guessing that might be a question for Jonathan or Quentin on, on the levitation, is it? Yeah, sorry, um, I didn't know which um, speaker he was referring to, but yeah, um, Jonathan, um, Quentin, if you can um, help us answer this question. So how long does it take for the material to lose their magnetic property? I can uh, attempt to answer that. Uh, so we, I don't think we uh, the materials loses their magnetic properties uh, during the testing because otherwise we won't be. Uh, so the ma the materials that we process in uh, levitation technique, those are diamagnetic samples, and uh, we can only levitate diamagnetic samples in ELF, and they remain the magnetic property of the samples remain intact during the testing we don't lose them otherwise we won't be able to levitate them in the levitator
Thank you. Um, is there anything to add, Quentin, on this? No, I don't have anything to add on this. Like as Janet and just said, we are not losing any of the material properties uh, uh, in terms of um, magnetization during the experiments. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Anthony. Um, how does the quality of a weld in microgravity compare with a weld on the ground in terms of strength? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I Certainly the answer wouldn't be within any of the research that I carried out. Um, you know, I, I guess um, you're talking about uh, maybe repairing spacecraft in 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 orbit, etc. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually know. Um, is the answer? I don't know if if Quentin or Jonathan Jonathan would have any insight into that. Uh, I agree with Professor Brown. Uh, so the question as is entirely a different research and we don't uh, focus on that particular uh, uh, area, but it would be interesting to know that how the weldability is affected by microgravity. I would just add to that that I know that, for example, uh, future travel on uh, Mars, for example, they are thinking about that as an issue potentially, how we are going, going to weld uh, material on Mars knowing that it's under microgravity. So it has an impact. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how. Though. Thank you so I much. Think, for I, these yeah, questions. I think I think maybe um, it depends on the welding process because there are a lot of forces in welding like Lorentz forces if you're arc welding, um, Marangoni surface tension forces. Um, so the gravity force would be removed but I think in a lot of in a lot of um, welding processes the the force of gravity is overwhelmed by other forces leading to liquid flow so my guess is that the weld itself may not be all that different um, but I think there could be some practical problems of melting um, wires and um, Consumer, consumable electrodes in space because they won't just go down into a weld seam like they would on Earth. So you can't just stand over a weld seam and let gravity take in the liquid metal. You would have to have some sort of sealed delivery system to get it into the weld, you know, so some pressure pressurized system to get the, the weld to actually lay down in the at all in the first place. OK, thank you so much. I guess we found a new research topic. So yeah, um, exactly. Anthony, if you can um, research on that and let us know, um, that would be great. Um, our last question that I see in the chat is from Itamar. Um, how are dislocation mobility and hardening methods affected by microgravity? OK, I, th I think they're not affected by microgravity because generally solid state um, you know, solid state phenomena are not that much affected by gravity. It's really when you have a liquid or a fluid in in which there is a variation in density leading to sedimentation, buoyancy, natural convection, etc. That's really where you see a difference between microgravity and um, you know, Earth which is why I mentioned that of, of the manufacturing processes like metal forming, rolling, etc., in which you're, you have plasticity and dislocation mediated deformation. You know, these are not really subjects for um, microgravity research. So on the other hand, it would mean that you could probably do rolling and forging, you know, very successfully on in, in zero gravity if, if you could you know, if you could get the equipment up there and, and um, you know, st stop things from floating around. Um, Jonathan, Quentin, is there anything to add? I would not be able to discuss this question, unfortunately. 
I really yes, I don't have anything to add on Professor Brown's answer to this. No precipitation hardening. No, not wouldn't wouldn't be affected either. Yep. Thank thank you for answering the follow up question. So I think we've gone through all the questions. Um, thank you for um, everyone for all these questions and for engaging with us. Um, thank you so much, Professor um, David Brown and also Jonathan and Quentin for the answers and the amazing presentations. It, it's really great to see the different um, aspects actually because in the morning we had more um, presentations about crystal growth, but in the afternoon we had a, a total overview of the different platforms about solidification of alloy and we saw thermophysical property measurements so it, it's really great to see the it, it's the same science field but we see so many different things going on so thank you all so much for the presentations thank you indeed and thank you hazuki for um chairing the session and for inviting us along thank you so much Okay, um, before all of you leave, I'd like to ask you, please, please answer our questionnaire form. My colleague Wenbin has put it in the chat, so please um, make sure to answer. We'd really like to hear your feedback. We'd really like to provide you with better webinars. So please let us know um, what you thought of today's webinar. Second, um, the recordings, um, the presentations are already on the website, but I will try to put the recordings on our website as soon as possible so that you can share to your colleagues or friends who missed out on today. So please um, keep accessing our website. Um, I'll definitely do it during this week. And lastly, um, next web, the next webinar is next week, same time, same place. Um, it's going to be about fluid dynamics. So we're still going to be focusing on physical science, but more on fluid dynamics. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Um, thank you for the crowd for engaging with us. Thank you to all the speakers. I look forward to seeing you again um, next week. So everyone, take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you for the invitation.